This will be part one of a two-part video of me making a fancy holster and belt rig with a lot of tooling and even more nickel spots. Obviously this first video is the holster. Make sure to like and subscribe and turn on notifications for the second video where I make a matching belt. Before that I want to say that I have taken note of comments asking for more explanation of what I'm doing in my videos. Most of my videos are just that, a video of me making a particular piece with perhaps a occasional subtitle. I do this simply because it's quicker and easier to produce videos that way. I do this as a hobby, so the time available for me to produce videos like this is limited. However, I do understand that some of what I do may not be self-evident, so to that end, I'm going to be using voiceover to give more detailed information about what you see me do on screen, as well as a lot more subtitles. Also note that the way I'm doing things may not be the quote-unquote correct way, it's just the way that works for me. This new holster pattern is, is new to me. I developed this just for this rig. If you haven't seen my previous video on making vintage money belt rigs, I'll direct you to that. But for those who have, you'll recognize the craft foam that I'm using to make a mock-up of this holster. So the shell is made out of 9-ounce veg stand leather. I typically buy my leather as double shoulders, sides, or bends. It just really depends on what's available, what the cost is, and, and how the hides look. I find that using a flashlight helps highlight the scribe lines better. And once the pattern is cut out, I'll usually run across the edges with a sander just to smooth down any imperfections that might get transferred onto the groove lines. So the outside line is my stitch line, and I'm going to just use the creaser attachment on this. I'm not actually cutting a groove. I usually keep a piece of scrap leather nearby to make practice cuts on and to make adjustments on the groover with. In this case, I have several sizes of nickel spots to account for. One of the challenges of filming all this is keeping the focus of action in center frame. So you'll see me moving the leather around quite a bit, probably more than I would normally if I, if I wasn't filming it. I'll just point out that I often start my cuts here in this area where the skirt folds over the, uh, the body of the holster just so if there's anything wrong, like for instance I didn't have my brow nut tightened down or I've just got the wrong distance, that any sort of screw ups will be hidden back there. It's better to have it happen there than somewhere else more obvious.
Here I'm prepping the leather for tooling, also called casing. I use a mix of water and saddle soap. The saddle soap does a couple of things. First, it lubricates the leather fibers to help the swivel knife glide through the leather a bit more easily. It also helps the stamps make better impressions by making the leather a bit more moldable. It also slows down the drying process a little, which helps by not having to re-wet it as often during tooling. I usually let the leather sit in a bag, if not overnight, for at least a few hours. So for tracing my pattern, I used to use just plain tracing paper, but plain tracing paper is fairly thin and not very durable. Uh, I like to use these thicker sheets of almost like a vellum type material. You'll often find these uh, being used for like wedding invitations. Um, you can find these in craft store or, or Amazon. So it's a little bit lazy but I don't want to come up with a whole new design myself. The floral motif for this piece will be lifted off of one of Will Gormley's patterns. This particular one is the Law Dog Holster. Although I'll be using a completely different tool set for it than what's shown on the cover images for the pattern. All of Will's patterns are excellent and I highly recommend them. I transfer the pattern onto my vellum with a sharpie. So now I transfer the pattern onto the leather, and for this I'm just using a stylus tool. So this video isn't really meant to be an in-depth instructional on my particular way of tooling floral patterns. Uh, it would just really be way too long, but if you are interested in something more along those lines, I will direct you to my previous five-part series on tooling for the Hand of God holster. Uh, but for this video, I'll just focus on one particular section of the tooling and list the tools I'm using using the subtitles.
So there's a couple of belts holding this holster together and to do this I'm using the craft tool strap cutter and this is one of those tools that really work as advertised. Uh, when I first started I would buy pre-cut straps but it's so much cheaper just cutting your own. I need to thin one of these straps down a little bit. This is the craft tool high tech leather splitter and uh, this is actually something I did one of my very first videos on. Uh, if you need to know more about this, I would refer you back to that. I have a few edge bevelers. Over the years, I've settled on this particular number two for almost all my beveling. It's a craft tool, and the face is concave on it. 
I'm not sure exactly which model number it is, but uh, I find it much easier to use than other bevelers. I mostly use Phoebe's dye, and I usually don't use it straight from the bottle. I cut it with alcohol so I can build up the colors and do things like make gradient effects. I work in my garage, so I just open up the doors and turn on fans for ventilation. The only downside to this is if someone who bought a holster comes back and asks for a matching belt, then matching colors could be something of an issue. I'm making a large batch here so I have enough to make the belt later on. This is just a scrap piece to test my color. I like to use synthetic wool applicator pads to put on my dye whip, and I try to always use circular motions. So the dyeing process dries out the leather quite a bit, so I'm going to replenish it with some neat spot oil here. This will help prevent cracking. It also has the benefit of deepening the colors. One of the biggest changes I've made recently is using milled leather for my linings. Milled leather is veg tan that goes through an extra processing step in a tumbler to soften it. It almost feels like chrome tan and is identified by a more pronounced grain texture. It can also be dyed. Most importantly for me, I can glue and stitch my linings flat uh, instead of curved around a dowel rod like I've done in my previous videos where I'm using regular veg tan. The milled leather basically eliminates the crinkling issues when the holster body is folded. So once the knees foot oil has had some time to penetrate, I'll usually work the leather a bit. It's still kind of stiff from the dyeing process. So those leather fibers are still kind of tightened up. Uh, I am just kind of breaking it in here to, to loosen it up.
So the antique paste, you basically just want to slop it on, get it into all crevices, and then immediately wipe it off before it has time to dry. So once the antique paste is dry, I'm going to go over the tooling with a melamine foam pad. This is sometimes sold under brand names like Mr. Clean. This is just to bring out the highlights. Um, if you haven't seen my weathering video, uh, I will direct you towards that. And if you want to be a little bit more aggressive with the highlighting, you can go over it with some fine grit sandpaper. And here I'll just say that the domed rivets are so much easier to work with than traditional pronged nickel spots. The problem is you just can't find these in a lot of different sizes.
So this is my favorite glue, Rhenia Aquilium 315. That's probably a botched pronunciation. But you'll see me using it in all my leather working videos. This is a leather working glue. It is harder to find, it's more expensive, but it is water-based, has almost no odor and non-toxic. I have become somewhat sensitive to the fumes of a lot of solvent-based contact cements out there. And this stuff is like working with Elmer's glue, and it's extremely strong. Just as strong as some of those other glues, in my opinion. So since some of these larger nickel spots are so close to the edge, I'm having to actually feed this through opposite of how I normally would, otherwise the presser foot would get in the way. And I'm having to go extremely slow. I also had to remove the edge guide attachment to feed the holster on to the right like this. In lieu of back stitching on the machine, I pull out these last few threads and saddle stitch them. I remove any residual glue off the edges with a sanding belt cleaner stick. You can find these at the hardware store. You can also use a rubber cement eraser.
Burnishing with a piece of denim will help catch and remove any last bits of liner glue that are left.
This buckle is fairly small. It's technically a hat band buckle. And I bought it simply because it was the shiniest. But it isn't taking the full force to keep in the holster together. The larger belt underneath it does. This is more of a decorative piece to keep that belt closed. And as you can see, I'm pulling on it with much more force than it would normally be subjected to. So it should be plenty strong enough. I've used lots of different hammer thong or tie downs over the years, but I found that a simple strap tied in a knot is most reliable. 